Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to our workshop. Today I'm going to share all the juicy points that I've been able to collect uh, in the 10 years now that I've been, uh, been looking into this, these topics. And uh, today's focus is going to be on uh, the ancient culture, the Sumerian culture, which very interestingly enough has very strong biblical ties to the English and Old Hebrew Testament stories of man's interaction with their living gods. Okay, so where do we come from? I touched on this basically a little bit in my lecture, but the scientific viewpoints for where we come from uh, always kind of have butted heads with either evolution or religious. And the scientific viewpoints are starting to uh, push the notion that life more than likely arose on Earth from panspermia, that somehow life arrives whole and complete. There isn't enough time on the evolution of Earth scale, 4.5 billion years, something like that, 4.7, for life to have just whimsically come together in primordial soup and a lightning bolt striking it and all of a sudden there's life. So one of the theories they're starting to push is that possibly life actually arose, uh, arrived at uh, Earth whole and, per, uh, whole and complete. So uh, this, this is pushed uh, further with uh, the research that we've done by looking at asteroids and comets, things where we've actually sent out things in space with an aerogel catcher and collect fragments and debris from these and found, wow, here's carbon and many of the minerals and things that we need for life to get started are found uh, floating around in space and arrive here in the form of comets and asteroids. Um, so one of the things that we can really start to look for with our science is to start to confirm life beyond just Earth. And one of those environments that could be very hospitable to life is one of the moons of Jupiter called Europa. Now, the reason why this is really interesting is many of the other moons, Ganymede, Callisto, four, there's four major moons of, uh, of Jupiter, but Ganymede and Callisto have extensive volcanic activity. And Europa, as you can see here, uh, has extensive water. Now, the surface is covered by a 40 mile, excuse me, a very thick ice sheet that you can see it's cracked here and it's kind of like, almost like plate tectonics here on Earth where the ice is always kind of shifting and so it gives us a view of how this planet is working but interestingly enough, Europa has a 40 mile deep ocean below this ice. So they theorize if we're able, able to, and we are, there's a mission coming up in 2007 to do just this, if we do penetrate this ice sheet and go down to the, uh, the surface of, of the ocean on Europa, there could be processes taking place just like they're here on Earth. When we go way down into the ocean, no sunlight whatsoever, there are these vents uh, you know, emanating hot minerals and, and uh, sulfur and various other elements where life is thriving. So you wouldn't think it would be possible without sunlight or heat, but here at the bottom of the ocean, uh, where there's thermal vents exist, there's life thriving. So we just apply that same science to here we have another ocean on one of our moons of Europa. Maybe this is a possible uh, good uh, habit habitable place for life to uh, evolve as well. So as we look at uh, the more specifically how we came into the picture, uh, there's this overriding theory of the missing link. Uh, that you know everything so simplistic is going to become more complex, but for whatever reason, science has, been not, has not been able to connect us to the Neanderthal man. So there's been all these su successions of, of uh, the hominoid, but nothing that can actually put us in a connection with them. So that they say that there's a missing link, that at some point we're going to find some species that actually connects us to the Australopithecine and all these various other Neanderthal men that evolution says we, we come from. So when we look at many of these structures all over the earth, uh, Stonehenge and uh, Egypt and Giza, we start to realize that there was a brilliance being displayed by ancient man that we don't attribute to them. That using stone tools and living in clay huts for, for the most part, they weren't able, as we would reckon, to be able to build such devices. But we still have all around the world evidence of them building and having a technology to build structures that we still can't even duplicate. And as an example here, we're looking at a quarry. There's a gentleman here. It's actually, his name is Ted. He's uh, one of our people selling videos in the, <laughs> in the other room. But he went on a trip where this is a, a quarry. And this is Baalbek in Lebanon. You can see another gentleman standing here. 
by the rocks. And interestingly enough, these rocks, they're called trilithoton stones. They weigh like hundreds of, hundreds of tons. And this one was left at the quarry site, un, you know, slightly broken, but it was five miles away from where they took these things into Baalbek and stacked them. So interestingly enough, they had the ability to cut out these rocks and quarry them out and move them five miles where we still yet today don't really have technology that can cut a perfect rock out of the ground and move it, you know. So it's very interesting that there are a lot of these types of artifacts around the world that show us that ancient man was somehow utilizing a type of technology that we still can't configure, we still can't get our hands on how they were doing it. So one of, the, one of the areas that's really sparked my interest in looking at all these structures, Giza, Nazca, Stonehenge, Machu Picchu, Tiwanaku, I really started to want to know, well, who's the first culture? Where does all of this come from? Uh, and this led me to uh, the culture that we have evidence of that came literally right out of the Stone Age, uh, where modern day Iraq is, known as Mesopotamia, uh, Babylon, but the first culture to show up there uh, were called Sumerians. And this is right between the Tigris and Euphrates, that strip of land there, it's kind of hard to see, it's called Mesopotamia. Uh, but then Mesopotamia, Babylon, that's today's Iraq. And this culture has left us uh, artifacts in the form of stone tablets, pictograms, uh, some of their monuments that still exist. But for the most part, their evidence exists in two forms. One of them is a clay tablet, and another one is called a cylinder seal. What the Sumerians uh, devised was this an ingenious way of being able to have like, kind of like an ancient printing press where what they would do is they would reverse carve a picture into this round cylinder seal. Now scholars today still are baffled as to how they were able to carve in reverse such accurate pictures so that when you would roll it over wet clay, it leaves the positive imprint. So we have a lot of this information that was disseminated by the Sumerians on a daily basis about events, courts, laws, judges, uh, schooling. Uh, so all of these things they recorded on stone tablets and they also had a written language that was called cuneiform script. It consisted of over 400 characters and it was basically like a, an oversized screwdriver that they would twist and turn it and make all these little characters called cuneiform script. Now a, an alphabet with over 400 characters is pretty complex and it's very interesting that the Sumerians literally right out of the Stone Age show up and are bequeathing us information that literally over 100 of the firsts needed for a modern culture came from the Sumerians. One of those things was mathematics. They had a base math of 6 and 10. Now, usually people would just round this off to say 60, sexagesimal, but it was actually the number 6 and the number 10 separately so that they could do very large and very small integers. Um, they were the first ones to uh, devise a metric system. They were the first ones to give 12 inches to the foot, 360 degrees to the circle, 12 hours in a day, 12 months in a year, 60 seconds. All of these were derivatives of the number 12 and also the number 6. That number 12, though, is a key, uh, a key point that I'll, uh, I'll stress here as you'll, as you'll see as we go on. So myth or facts, one of the great scholars that we have who's really divulged into this research, now at 83, his name's Zachariah Sitchin, and he's one of the pinnacle researchers as a linguist of about 220 people in the world, 220 in the whole world, that can actually directly read Sumerian cuneiform script. So Zachariah Sitchin has really taking, taken on uh, an interesting scholastic approach to information that modern linguists and archaeologists aren't quite ready to accept. Now, linguists today will squabble over the meaning of this word or the meaning of this phrase, but Zachariah Sitchin was one of the very few linguists to look at all of the information being told, all of the context, all of the meaning, and put it into a, a context that makes sense, that starts to combine science, but also explains where we come from, the religious aspects of this information. So I was really intrigued by the research that he's done. He's written a series of books called The Earth Chronicles. You can see a few of them here. Zachariah Sitchin is now 83 years old, so it's up to myself and many of the other younger generations to continue on and, and uh, hold these principles to truth. So here's a, an evidence of cuneiform script. Sometimes they would write on semi-precious stones, uh, but uh, you, you can see it's uh, a system of, again, little lines and triangles. But uh, 
very interesting, very interesting details of what they were describing. Now, they'll teach you in high schools or in the college institutions today that the Sumerians were the first ones to invent writing and the first ones to have mathematics. But they don't ever tell you specifically what they were writing or how extensive their knowledge really was. So one of the other information pieces that I've tried to focus on with the Sumerians is not only did they have a very vast knowledge of mathematics and science, uh, education, they were also very aware of astronomy. And they were the first ones, for instance, to invent the 12 houses of the zodiac, by di di dividing the heavens into 12 parts. Uh, they came up with a system so that at the time of Halekleo rising, this is basically if you look out right when the sun is rising, the sun just in the, you know, in the very early morning is rising against the, sp you know, like the dark of space and you can see a constellation what the sun is rising against. So if we see Aquarius or Sagittarius or Leo, what constellation the sun is rising against you're in the age of Aquarius, you're in the age of Pisces. So they were able to devise a very ingenious way and knew about precession, this 25,000 year cycle, to bequeath all this information about astronomy so that now, when we have technology, we can start to look at this information and start to wonder, what were they trying to tell us? Now along with this information about outer planets, the distance between the outer planets, what the planets look like in space, they very specifically give some information that when modern scholars and archaeologists first started doing excavations in Iraq, early 1900s, late 1800s, early 1900s, they started to pull out all of these artifacts where, in some cases, the Sumerians are talking about beings called the Anunnaki. And that term just means those who from heaven come to earth. But at the time, in the early 1900s, many of these scholars finding these artifacts and uh, the Sumerians speaking of the Anunnaki, uh, interaction with their living gods, talking about the outer planets. Scholars didn't quite understand this information, so they threw it all into a big myth pile and just left it untouched as these are cultural mythologies coming from a culture that is not rooted in science. We're not going to even venture into the idea that they were actually visited by beings from another planet. Can't go there. So that's where modern scholarly views stop. But again, people like Zachariah Sitchin, myself, Eric Von Danik, and others will look at this information and say, well, what if they were trying to convey things that they only understood by the terms they had at the time? So if you see a flying object in the sky or a being coming out of a glowing ship to whatever effect, you're going to think of it as a god. Anything at that time flying in the skies was alive, a bird, you know, an animal. So many of the artifacts that they've left us uh, show us information that we have to look through the eyes of the ancient person to, to see what they were trying to tell us. But from a modern view, again, some of these things uh, we can prove with our technology. And one of those, from the astronomical standpoint, was they had a very vigorous uh, view about astronomy and tracked things that happened in our heavens over hundreds of years. Here's a tablet stored in the British Museum that shows observations of Venus. Here's another one that uh, recorded natural weather events, things that were taking place. Uh, and this was, again, something that they would do over generations of time and pass this down as sacred information. Anyone who was able to read this information uh, was, it was a privilege. They had, they had scribes and priests and to be able to write cuneiform script was an honor. And so the information that was held by these priests was something that was uh, very esoteric. One of the tablets, for instance, um, would be able to predict 50 years in advance on, on what specific day a lunar eclipse would take place. So they could know 50 years in advance on this specific day we're going to have a lunar eclipse. It's very interesting information. Uh, again, another tablet just showing at some point where certain stars were in the sky and tracking their progression. So what really starts to uh, raise the question is, is, you know, was ancient man visited by gods or possibly ancient astronauts. Many of the tales that we have in the biblical form of chariots of fire or Ezekiel's wheel uh, or you know, Noah uh, having in, uh, interactions with uh, a god telling him to build a craft. Uh, many of these stories have a Sumerian counterpart where it's literally word for word the same tale but told in a Sumerian script that's recorded in stone, unchanged. So. To put that into perspective, you know, we have the New King James uh, English version of the Bible, but that has been translated from the New Testament to the Old Testament to various other Semitic languages as a compilation of 
the original tales told by the Sumerians, which we have in stone unchanged. So when we start to look at many of these texts that talk about angels in the Bible and depict the angels in the Bible with a halo and with wings, these aren't the first generation of these depictions. There's actually the Sumerian depictions that, again, predate uh, the Hebrew God and the Christian God by thousands of years. And let me put it into perspective so you understand what I'm saying. We're in the year 2005, which is basically 2,000 years removed from when the time of Christ was here, A.D. to B.C. So if you go back another 2,000 years from that point, you're at the time of the Abraham God. Go back another 2,000 years from that, 6,000 years, 4,000 years, 4,000 B.C., 6,000 years, and you're at the time of the Sumerians. So it's a good leap back in, in history. So uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the tales that we have in English just specifically talk about heaven. Heaven is up there somewhere and the gods come from heaven. Uh, but this is actually a misnomer because all of the references of the word heaven in the New King James Version are meant to just be conveying the skies. They're not talking about pearly gates up there with clouds, you know, somewhere mythically. They're talking about the skies. So if we were to actually just replace the word heaven with skies, it really starts to bring in a lot more context for beings coming down from the skies. So many of the depictions that we still have left to us uh, in ancient Iraq, this is actually a stellar that's held in Iran, show a time when the Sumerians had interaction with their living gods, which they called the Anunnaki. And here we see a depiction of an Anunnaki coming down on what the Sumerians depicted him as having the power of flight. So they are depicting him coming down and, and meeting a Sumerian king, and you can see the Sumerians uh, underneath here holding up the, the view. Now, interestingly enough, I've kind of like to made a joke that, you know, here's the king meeting the Sumerian god, and these must be the taxpayers making it possible for him to do this. <laughs> But we have these wall reliefs uh, all over the Middle East that show a connection, just like it spawned into Egyptian cultures of the winged disc. This winged disc is the reference gave by the Sumerians of the Anunnaki and that they had the power of flight. Now, again, if you're living in a clay hut and using stone tools, you're not going to know the difference between gods and extraterrestrials. So beings having the power of flight, they don't know how to depict that other than to say wings, just like they would see in nature. A bird has wings, it has the power of flight. Another, uh, another view of this, uh, of this stellar. Another thing I'd like to point out too is a couple years ago when we invaded Iraq again, uh, one of those interesting points is we still don't know why. Weapons of mass destruction, oil, no. What was it? So there's been a lot of uh, speculation from the ufological point of view uh, that interestingly enough Saddam Hussein Iraq, Sumer, same place is very aware of his heritage and his connection to the Anunnaki and has done several things uh, now this is just rumor and speculation but had several things underway where he was actually trying to build like an Anunnaki theme park and there have been diagrams and things found um, I have a couple of connections military-wise of people in Iraq who have sent me uh, some art pieces and things found in a couple of Saddam's palaces that show just very interesting connections where um, Saddam was aware of this information bequeathed by the Anunnaki. Um, so some of the artifacts here, again, you know, you can see the detail. This is uh, one of the gods that the Sumerians depicted as Ishtar, also known as Inanna, and she was known to roam the skies of Earth. And there's an interesting tale that uh, she was a very attractive female, a female god, and at some time she would choose male counterparts to bring up into her adobe and um, have sexual relations with them. Uh, but unfortunately, those men would always be killed afterwards. And there's a famous king that relays this tale in a Sumerian text. His name is Gilgamesh. And uh, very interestingly, he talks about how Ishtar had her eyes upon him and, and invited him up and said, you know, thank you, but no thanks <laughs> because of what you've, uh, what you've been known to do with uh, various other men who have come to visit you. Uh, so the interesting thing that I, I just point out here is that this is a, a, a typical wall relief the Sumerians left us of the Anunnaki. Basically, this specifically uh, is an Anunnaki that was in charge of a spaceport. Now, this is information uh, bequeathed to us by Zachariah Sitchin. Again, 
one of about 220 people in the world that can directly translate Sumer uh, Sumerian cuneiform script. Um, and, and, and what he's translated, the Sumerians are describing here one of their Anunnaki. And some of the things I'd point out is in his, in his right hand, he's holding the fruit of life and the water of life in the other hand. So these are, again, symbologies that we have for the Garden of Eden and the Tree of Life and the fruit and many of these things. And also, I've kind of pointed out several times, you'll see around his, his wrist what, what, as I would interpret it, to be a watch. But, you know, back then, the Sumerians uh, wouldn't understand what technology is. So several of the wall reliefs that show these Anunnaki with some type of wristband, it looks more like of a floral pattern. Whether or not they were wearing just a wrist, you know, a bracelet of some kind, I think it's very possible, just like with our state of technology, they might have had some type of small wrist device, and they're depicting that as accurately as, like, accurately as they could uh, in, in, um, in a stellar. But very interesting, you know, when we look at uh, the same symbology used by NASA, you know, 6,000 years from now, I doubt that anyone's going to look at the Sumerian depictions of the Anunnaki and uh, try and really question what they were saying. I don't think you can hear that. It's not loud enough, but... We copy it down, Eagle. The Eagle has landed. But when we land on the moon, the first thing that they say is the Eagle has landed. So this, this symbology used by NASA is the same thing that the Sumerians were doing, showing the Anunnaki had the power of flight. 6,000 years from now, people aren't going to look at the Apollo 11 symbol and say, whoa, what were they doing, landing birds on the moon? No, they're going to understand that we were just symbolically saying we had the power of flight, just like the Sumerians were showing us with the Anunnaki that they had the power of flight. So another interesting thing, again, with the Tree of Life, here we have a, a Sumerian tale with writing very specifically explaining what's going on and symbolic imagery explaining. And uh, this tale talks about the Tree of Life. And interestingly enough, here at the very top of it, we have a male figure in some type of flying craft. Now, again, archaeologists looked at this as mythology and said, oh, they're just depicting you know, mythological tales of information. But when we start to analyze all of the information and put into context the knowledge they had from a scientific viewpoint, it's very possible if anyone's able to step beyond that, that one little hurdle and say, you know, extraterrestrials do exist, there's enough evidence to look at this information in the light of saying, wow, the Sumerians had a vast amount of information. And if you were to ask them, how do you know all this information? They say, everything we know, we were taught by the Anunnaki. So here are some uh, interesting uh, cylinder seals and, uh, and wall reliefs. These are held in the British Museum. I was able to hire a professional antiquities photographer a few years back who went to the British Museum in the Louvre in Paris where they have the two largest collections of Sumerian artifacts online. I had him digitally photograph all these, and I have them stored on my xfacts.com website so that through progression of years, we can still look at this, God forbid, if there's other wars and things, and we blow up what remnants of our heritage we have left in Iraq. There is still information that can be derived from this, from, from this source so that you know maybe there are medical advances or things about our genetic makeup that if they don't already know about it and are hiding it, maybe at some point we will be able to discover this and, and learn more about ourselves. And, and in doing so, you'll see by what the Sumerians have left us that it's, it's very interesting information. Here's just a kind of a close-up uh, wall relief of one of the Anunnaki. You can see, again, the amazing detail. You can see symbolically his divinity by the horns on his head. Again, holding the fruit of life, the tree of life. We've got those two wrist devices again. Uh, just, you know, very interesting detail for a culture coming right out of the Stone Age, literally popping up overnight with the first evidences of agriculture and science and astronomy and math. And everything they say they learned, they were taught by these beings. But modern archaeology isn't quite ready to accept ET. So that's the stopping point. But if you can get beyond that hurdle, again, this, this takes on a new life. Here's just another... Uh, a little bit more detail showing, showing one of the Sumerian Anunnaki. Here he's uh, holding uh, like a deer or a, an antelope of some kind. But just the amazing detail that they have left us, this is a wall relief held in Iran, the colors and just the clarity, it's just very interesting uh, that they were able to, to do all this uh, without the aid of technology as, as we would like to think. Here's another uh, cylinder seal that shows the god Ishtar as I mentioned earlier. And uh, again, not being a Sumerian uh, linguist, 
I'm not able to translate these, but in looking at many of the cylinder seals over time, I've been able to distinguish certain key references like the winged disc, the Anunnaki, uh, and they show up repeatedly. And one of those, of course, is this winged disc, the Anunnaki coming down on a winged disc. So the only thing that I interpret this as, as you know, the Sumerians were seeing something happening at a time when the Sumerians actually did live amongst their living gods. Now, many questions arise. Why don't we see them today? Where have they gone? Were they actually ever here? Um, and that's something that, uh, that uh, modern science is finally starting to catch up on for us to pinpoint specifically if we actually do have ancestors on another planet in our solar system, if that's, if that's even possible. Um, so the, the information by the Sumerians really starts to take a new twist when we look at specifically their astronomical evidence speaking about where these gods come from, where the Anunnaki come from. And the Anunnaki came from another planet within our solar system, what the Sumerians described. This planet was called Nibiru. Nibiru in English just meant planet of the crossing. So uh, an interesting, I think I have a slide in here somewhere, but an interesting thing to note is, you know, Christianity and using the symbolism of Jesus on the cross the Sumerians depicted Nibiru as planet of the crossing 4,000 years before Christianity as the home of their gods. And this symbol, a cross, was transfigured and, and changed basically into uh, further cultures as the winged disc. So what I'll show here is actually some of the cylinder seals and tablets where they actually talked about this ancient planet Nibiru. And here you can see one of the kings seated and right above him is a cross in the sky, which was a symbolic reference of that planet, Nibiru. And here, as I was just uh, explaining, the, the, the top one you're looking at is a, a relief from a cylinder seal that showed during daylight hours, uh, the sun was glowing, but still very bright in the sky, there was a bright glowing cross. And this was a time when this planet, as the Sumerians describe, was visible in the sky. Now. The Anunnaki uh, very specifically explained the orbit of their home planet and how it was a part of our solar system. Uh, one of the things that was interesting about this information about our solar system is they described Earth as the seventh planet. They called it Ki. Um, you know, the sacred number seven, seven days in a week, seven tablets of creation actually by the Sumerians. The, you know, like the Genesis has seven days of creation. The Sumerians actually have seven tablets, seven stone tablets that explain our creation process. Um, interestingly enough, on this relief, here we see a symbol of the winged disc for Nibiru, and right next to it you see seven dots, which is the symbol for Earth. So there are uh, several reference points to show that the Sumerians described Earth as the seventh planet. And to, to put that into context, what we're looking at here is just an artist's rendition. But the Sumerians were aware of 12 planets. They counted the nine planets that we know of, plus the sun, our moon, making 11, and then an additional planet, which they called Nibiru, which was way, way far beyond Pluto. Now, they, they gave uh, a completed circle an orbit of this planet, they called it a shar, and, and it was 3,600 years to go around one orbit of the sun. Um, our Earth, for instance, you know, a solar day here on Earth is 365 days. The Sumerians described a solar uh, cycle for Nibiru as 3,600 years. So Nibiru only goes around our sun every 3,600 years. Long, long, elongated orbit, as they describe it. So uh, just in a, you know, an interesting uh, coincidence again, that if you count from coming outside the solar system in, we are actually on the seventh planet. Not the third rock from the sun, the hip term that we hear today, but if the Anunnaki were actually coming from outside our solar system in, and if you count from Pluto, Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Earth is the seventh planet. Another interesting Sumerian artifact just shows uh, again, not being a Sumerian linguist, not sure the meaning of this, other than I can recognize the symbology. Here we see an ancient depiction of Nibiru by the cross and its crescent moon, seven dots of Earth and our crescent moon. Uh, another interesting cylinder seal again, uh, showing the seven dots of Earth and the winged disc in a, another Sumerian stellar. And the interesting thing about uh, the seven dots, as we see here, when you go to the British Museum and the Louvre in Paris, in the descriptions by standard archaeology, 
these seven dots are thought to be the seven sisters of Pleiades. So the seven stars of Pleiades. Now, Zachariah Sitchin and myself and many others uh, don't follow the normal archaeological path of what the accepted explanation is. I'm more inclined to think of what Sitchin has said, that this is actually the seven dots representing Earth, based upon all the information that we have bequeathed, bequeathed by the Sumerians. So here's a very interesting uh, tablet that's got, gained quite a bit of popularity. Um, interestingly enough, you, know, you can see the date there. It's very, very old. And basically what it's showing is uh, the Anunnaki king granting man uh, the plow for modern agriculture, basically. But interesting, uh, what we see at the top between those two gentlemen is a complete depiction of our solar system. So. Since the time of Copernicus and Galileo, man thought that Earth was the center of the universe, or the center of the galaxy, if you will. Uh, and it turns out that the Sumerians knew that the sun, and that we rotated around the sun thousands of years ago, de uh, de depicting it accurately. They actually depicted all of the planets and the sizes of the planets correctly, and included one more planet as this additional 12th planet, Nibiru. So again, just from the time of Copernicus and Galileo, using mathematics you know, to gauge the distance between the planets and look at the information both with telescopes and with mathematics, uh, you know, the Sumerians were aware of information that modern science is just now starting to catch up with. This is a very interesting uh, artifact, uh, one of the artifacts translated by Zachariah Sitchin. And another thing that archaeologists will tell you is that ancient man wasn't familiar with the ellipse, a circle. So here we have the Sumerian stone tablet, which is in the shape of an ellipse. And just this one section where I've circled it red, Zechariah Sitchin has translated it to show some very interesting information. Uh, very clearly, it's talking about which path the Anunnaki would take from their vicinity of where Nibiru was to our vicinity of where Earth was. And specifically in the translation, uh, Zachariah Sitchin has shown that the key words here, you can see the, where I've labeled Nibiru for a mountainous, planet, a, a mountainous planet, and the course correction where they would, you can see the names of the planets that were listed, and on the sides it's like rocket, rocket, mountain, mountain, pile up, high, high, high. But if you count, there are seven dots that it has to go by. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, until you arrive at the seventh planet, Earth. So, very interesting Sumerian artifact that specifically is telling us the course correction taken by the Anunnaki to get from Nibiru to Earth. Now, an interesting part of the information uh, of the Sumerian lexicon is that they have, as I said, seven tablets of creation. There's actually a very long tale called the Enuma Elish that very specifically explains how our solar system came to be, how Earth formed, and more specifically, how we came about. The Sumerians uh, speak of a time when our Earth hasn't, hadn't even finished coalescing, 4.7 billion years, whatever, and an intruder planet appears, a rogue planet. As Zachariah Sitchin has translated it, this planet got pulled into the inner part of our solar system, was, uh, uh, let me go back one slide here for a minute, uh, was pulled into the inner part of our solar system by the gravitational pull of the outer planets, was pulled in, and a collision took place that formed and sculpted our solar system to, to, the, to the way it is today. Now, one of those things uh, on the modern science that has, has collaborated or shed some light on this type of theory is something that they call the Orpheus theory. And it was basically a show that they had on the Discovery Channel about a year ago that shows how they could have explained the formation of Earth's moon. And they said that a rogue planet at our distant point came in, whacked our primitive Earth, and in doing so, those debris coalesced to form our moon. Now, what's interesting about this story is it's very close to what the Sumerians describe of an ancient cataclysmic event between this planet called Nibiru and our once then called Tiamat, before it was our Earth. So what basically took place was planet X, or Nibiru, is pulled into the inner part of our solar system, comes so close on the first pass to whacking Earth that on the next path, one of the moons of Nibiru, labeled North Wind, actually struck our primitive Earth, cracking it in half and strewing out the fragments to leave our asteroid belt. Now this is what the Sumerians describe, and the English Bible tells you is the hammered out bracelet of God. So this is just a Sumerian description of what the English translations tell you, but much more detail. 
So they say that Nibiru, or Planet X, has this interaction with Earth and goes on to then have a 3600 very elongated orbit around our sun. Uh, one of the interesting things that I'd like to point out is, uh, you know, Nibiru, when it passes by the inner part of our solar system, every 3,600 years, as the Sumerians are telling us, there has been evidence to show that there has been cataclysmic events based upon the interaction of this planet coming back into our solar system. Now, unfortunately, there was a lot of rumors spread a couple years ago about the return of this planet and what effects it might be causing or about to cause. And what I'd like to do to kind of squelch that rumor uh, is show that basically we're talking 4.7 billion years ago when this initial collision took place. And if Nibiru has a 3,600 year orbit, we're looking, around, we're looking at about over a million times Nibiru has completed that orbit. So I theorize that it's not, it's not always, po it might not be possible that every time Nibiru comes into the inner solar system that it has gravitational effects and, and, and uh, cataclysmic events here on Earth. Um, you know, it could be coming in another part of the sun when we're way over here and, you know, there might not be as great of an effect as there has been in the past. So I kind of like to squelch that rumor that it started right when it did by saying, no, you know, a planet that the Sumerians described, which is four to eight times the size of Earth, that's how big Nibiru is in the descriptions, four to eight times the size of Earth, will not be missed by amateur or professional astronomy. We have technology in place, which I'll show you, that is very accurate in, in being able to detect something that's planet size anywhere near our solar system. So again, one of those uh, tablets that I was uh, explaining that described this, this long tale of how Earth's solar system came about, how Earth was formed. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, these are still stored in the British Museum on display. So one of the things I like to point out is to uphold the Sumerian information. If this interaction did take place, Nibiru whacked our primitive Earth, making it into half a planet, leaving the asteroid belt to be that fragment debris. Let me back up 1.2, I want to show you something. If you look here by the scale of the distance between the planets, how they're separated by their orbits, Nibiru orbits between Mars and Jupiter, where the asteroid belt is. You know, if you look at the space in between Mars and Jupiter, there looks to be enough room depicted by them for a planet to freely, uh, freely uh, pass through there with enough space. Another just UFO reference that I just kind of spec speculating on, if any of you have heard of uh, MJ-12, uh, this mysterious group, MJ-12, um, one of the things I just thought was interesting is what we're talking about here is Nibiru passes between Mars and Jupiter, the 12th planet, Mars, Jupiter, 12th planet, MJ-12. I don't know what that means, but I just thought it was kind of a neat little coincidence, probably nothing. So if, if Earth is half a planet, if there was this initial interaction that took place and we're left with just basically half a chunk of land, well, where is the other half? So one of the things scientifically we can prove is that at one point, Earth was all one land mass, just a big one chunk of land. And just like the skin of an apple, the continents have spread out to where they are. But at some point, if, if it was just Pangaea, one lump of land, that means where's the other half? You know, natural hyperdimensional physics, or whatever, Earth's you know, formed into a sphere. But all of the water is basically covering a huge basin that at one point was just a big gaping cavity. Where did that come from? So just showing that when we connect all the continents, it does show that uh, Earth, uh, you know, Earth at one point was basically just one huge lump of land, kind of uh, directly explaining what the Sumerians were saying of, uh, of how this took place. So another interesting tablet that really uh, has gotten a lot of uh, publicity is the flood tablet stored in the British Museum. There was an archaeologist by the name of George Smith working with the British Museum in the early 1900s. He was able to translate and read cuneiform script and threw his hands up, screaming, running out of the room in awe, could not believe that here he had found a tablet thousands of years before the Hebrew or the English version telling the exact same story of Noah's Ark, of how um, a, a Sumerian man named Utenpissim, it's a great word, Utenpissim, I always find that name amazing. Hey, Utenpissim, how you doing? Uh, very uh, clearly was, was told by an Anunnaki, a Sumerian god, to build a craft, take all the animals in his surrounding areas, his family, and put them into this craft. And it's the same story, where he lets out the bird, brings back a branch, 
Um, but this is told in a Sumerian version thousands of years before the English Old Testament. So here's another uh, interesting uh, depiction of, again, in the English version of the Bible, we just have simply, there was a time before and after the deluge where there were giants upon the earth. I want to point out, too, that in this text, very specifically, they say why there was a great flood. Because Nibiru, in passing by, was going to crack off a large portion of the ice sheet in Antarctica and raise the water level significantly. Now, the Anunnaki, in their vast technology, knew this. And there was a whole... Uh, battle between the two rival Anunnaki gods, Enel and Anki, one of them who liked us, one of them who didn't, and they said, no, man has become too numerous and is doing all these things that we don't like, let him perish. It's, you know, too bad. But after the great flood and the Anunnaki come back and they see man on this hilltop, they smell the burning flesh of meat that they're cooking, and they realize, wow, we actually need man more than we realized because they give us the things that we you know, need, food, uh, they do our work for us. So it's a very interesting relationship that started to take place after the flood between man and our living gods. So one of the depictions again is giants upon the earth. Well here we have a Sumerian wall relief that shows an Anunnaki seated and Sumerians worshiping him. Now I, I know from Sumerian descriptions the Anunnaki are genetically fit, very aesthetic, uh, some of them are described to be much larger, six to eight feet, something like that. But we're not talking about like huge skeletons, giants. There have been a lot of rumors also on the internet that were basically photoshopped fake imagery that showed uh, huge skeletons being removed from Saudi Arabia and various other places. This is not the case, folks. There have not been any skeletons found on Earth that we know of publicly that are like over 10 feet large, you know, like a race of beings that existed. Now, it's not saying they didn't exist, but we have yet to find anything like that. So some of the information, again, collaborating the Sumerian uh, knowledge and wealth is that there has been pieces of uh, artifacts found throughout history that just modern science can't explain. How could they have known this? One of those things is uh, that they were able to accurately show the topography of the South and North Poles. And here we actually have a map that shows at one point the North, uh, the, the, that North America and South America were all still connected. Uh, and interestingly enough, the, typo the topography of the land is accurately depicted. Now, we're talking miles and miles of ice on the Antarctic, you know, in the subpolar regions where you can't just look at it, you know, or even from the sky know what the actual topography is. You have to use ground penetrating radar and actually know what the actual uh, border is. But they were able somehow in circulation in 1513, there was this, uh, this famous, you know, this famous admiral that had a map, uh, Paris Reese, that showed uh, very accurately the topography of North and South America, the routes that they were taken. And it's, it's, it's uh, accurately depicting the topography of uh, North and South Poles, which you can't do without ground, ground penetrating radar. So the information that really uh, has kicked my information of you know, curiosity is, where is this home planet of the Anunnaki? Not to say that Planet X is coming back to kill us or it's going to come, you know, cause some catastrophic event. I'm more interested in the notion that what if we can actually prove through science that we have ancestors on another planet? That for me would be very interesting to realize that our ancient gods at some point uh, do actually exist and there might be a time in our future when this interaction could take place again. So the search for Planet X uh, has taken on the modern view that anything beyond Pluto, a body beyond Pluto, would be the tenth planet. That's the scientific view of X unknown, but numerically also meaning 10. So again, the research uh, as uh, Dr. Robert Harrington and Zachariah Sitchin collaborated on in the early 80s, Zachariah Sitchin had an orbital model, again from the Sumerian information that showed a very elongated orbit, uh, its path around the sun, and then the work of Dr. Harrington where they collaborated on tape at the Naval Observatory where Dr. Harrington would show his model for the the, uh, the planet X that he was looking for and how he believed uh, that took place and Zachariah Sitchin was just kind of collaborating and confirming that the notion for a body on a highly elongated orbit four to eight times the size of Earth could be possible, that there could be a planet that has 
shown the effects on our solar system in the past, why Uranus is tilted, why various uh, planets like uh, Uranus and Neptune could have possibly been moons of Saturn that were detached and moved into their current position. All this disruption in our solar system was explained by the inclusion of another planet that caused all these effects. Now the research of Dr. Ver uh, Harrington is very interesting. Uh, it's still stored online in many Harvard astronomical abstracts that you can look at. And he has several plates stored where he was showing in what regions of the sky we thought we should be looking for this planet. Here are some of those actual plates. And the interesting thing about this research about a rogue planet uh, is that it's kind of a new idea that science really didn't accept the idea of a planet in an egg-shaped, elongated orbit, they're like, well, we've never seen anything like this. How can it be possible? Well, as soon as we took an image of it, we thought, wow, I guess it is possible. So this is one of the first extrasolar planets, or excuse me, a planet around another star. This is not our solar system, a completely different planet and star, where the planet here at the bottom, you can see, its orbit around its star is a very elongated orbit. So this caught astronomers by surprise in the fact that, wow, it is possible for a planet to rotate around its star and have an elliptical orbit. So this information about uh, Anibiru, or a tenth planet, really caught on in the early 80s when, when we launched this infrared astronomical satellite. And of course, you know, the news always liking to jump to a conclusion. Um, one of the things that they re released in the 80s was a news article by the Washington Post saying, wow, Planet X has been found. But that actually wasn't the case. It was just the news interpreting it a little differently. But when they turned on this telescope uh, and started to gather data, all of a sudden they were able to see uh, out in space in a way that they couldn't before. And all of a sudden they saw all these large bodies floating around that they're like, whoa, we never saw these before. So the news instantly grabbed a hold of that and said, well, one of these is, is a planet X. We don't know which one yet. We still have to map out the orbits and stuff, catalog them. But they quickly jumped on that bandwagon and said, oh, they found it. You know? uh, so there's been a, there's been a large uh, duration of, of viewing the sky now where we've released all kinds of satellites to do you know, imaging in the sky for looking for brown dwarfs, failed suns, rogue planets, all these things that we weren't able to penetrate on a temperature level through the dust clouds and various other things to see these large objects. But now we're finally starting to get the science released where consistently news has been coming out over the last decade that yes, something beyond the outer planets of Pluto is affecting orbits or is being detected uh, as a mystery revolving around the sun. What could it be? And even to this day, we have misinformation or speculation uh, about the 10th planet being found. Now, NASA, again, their standpoint is anything beyond Pluto, 9, it's the 10th. But what I'm looking for and what I will continue to prognosticate as the 10th planet, if it ever is found, would have to be a planet four to eight times the size of Earth, a big planet. So if we are to find a planet like that, that will really get on my radar as, ah, Here's something we need to watch out for because very specifically, we could have ancestors on that planet. Now, some of the technology that we have out there now that we've just started to you know, launch and utilize will be able to detect planets such as 48 times the size of Earth. This is a, tele a telescope called the CERTIF telescope. Uh, when they first launched this, I went to a, a seminar at the Jet Propulsion Laboratories and met with one of the lead astronomers on the project. Her name is Dr. Michelle Fowler. And I asked her point blank, do you believe that an object four to eight times the size of the Earth could exist in our solar system, but we just haven't detected it yes, yet. And she said, yes, I do. But this, this telescope is going to focus in on very specific points in the sky. It's not, it's not uh, like this one. We look back here. Let me go back a couple slides. I missed it. The wire was a very wide angle array. So it didn't really go out as far, but it would, it would be able to see a lot of information at once, whereas the CERTIF can hone in on a very specific point and gather very, very accurate detail. The like this image that we're seeing below here, uh, the information released by the CERTIF was just unbelievable in the detail that they were able to get. Here's what they would normally see in visible light up at the top. When they turn on the CERTIF and all of a sudden use all the new uh, instruments on board this, now all of a sudden all those little red dots you see highlighted, those are all stars. These are all in new information that's being able to be uh, bequeathed by these telescopes because of the level of technology that we're quickly approaching. So what's happened uh, 
over the last few years is that they're starting to use these telescopes to detect things beyond Pluto. And the first one that popped up was this thing called Crowar, and then they had Sedna. But as you'll see here in the diameter of what we're talking about, these are small objects. You know, these are just floating chunks of ice basically out there. And I don't really know what their actual makeup is. The latest one that they just found called Xena, they're really not even sure if its actual mass is larger than Pluto. But it's something that they've, you know, detected in their uh, you know, you know, s still doing uh, research on. But again, it's not, it's not the ancient planet X that, that my research is interested in. It's not a planet that's four to eight times the size of Earth. It's just a little hunk of ice out there. So, uh, you know, a lot of the technology we have, another one, this is a really great telescope out in Hawaii, the, the Keck Inferometer, where it can take two independent lenses and focus up at a point in space and super amplify this data so that they can overexpose the image and really get a clear picture of, uh, of what they're looking at. And again, this is, uh, this is technology that we have all over the Earth from a professional standpoint, but there's also amateur astronomy uh, taking place where, for the most part, like Hale-Bopp and some of these other discoveries, things are spotted by amateur astronomers before the professional community. It's pretty interesting. Now, the public at large, you know, amateur-wise, amateur -wise, I'm sure there's a lot of information about our solar system and about our planets that isn't in the public realm, like I'm showing you the Keck and the Sirtif, but trust me folks, you know, there's a lot more out there that we have, you know, military-wise and, and uh, black budget-wise, where they're collecting information and doing things in space that we just have no clue about. So this is again just another diagram explaining uh, in size and duration for when we talk about brown dwarfs or a failed star or something like that. You see here Jupiter. So the masses of the bodies that we're looking at and, and, and looking for in space and being able to catalog are really quite phenomenal in size. And as I touched on uh, in, my, in my lecture earlier, this idea of a threat from space really isn't something new. You know, again, all the way back from the time of the Sumerians talking about their ancient, uh, their ancient interaction with Nibiru, um, there is very possible uh, a threat from space that over the last few years, you know, Armageddon, Deep Impact, the media taking notice to this, there's also been a lot of evidence scientifically released, 2028, uh, Toitus, all these different asteroids and things with the Near Earth Object Program that they're starting to really start to pay attention to the possibility of us getting whacked by an object. And as I showed earlier again, you know, this this impact that took place with Shoemaker Levy 9 was very dramatic. And if, you know, uh, a piece of a fragment the size that hit Jupiter were to come anywhere near us, we would be toast. <laughs> Luckily, we have Jupiter. It's a very large uh, uh, gravity, you know, pulls in many of the debris that would be, that might hit us, gets pulled into Jupiter. So it's, it's nice that we have it. But uh, again, you know, we do have enough information to show that by the extinction of the dinosaurs or uh, various other things that uh, if, if we are subject to be whacked by some of this debris, uh, it, could, it could be a, a dark day for us on Earth. Now, I will point out this too. In my own personal opinion, um, from the ufology side, I think that for a long time, through the code word like the Star Wars program and stuff like that, they're not shooting down missiles. They're shooting down things that are coming in, whether that be alien spacecraft, which to some degree I believe, but it's very possible that we already have in place the technology to fend off asteroids and stuff like that. Why it's not publicly talked about, don't know. But my personal opinion is, is that there is technology in place so that we won't get taken out by an asteroid. Can't confirm that though. So again, just you know, deep, deep impact, all this stuff where it's starting to raise the public awareness of beyond just your job, raising your kids. There are stuff in the heavens, as we saw from Hale Bop that all of a sudden these things can appear in our skies and can cause an effect. So again, we need that, we need that killer prevention plan just in case uh, there aren't the tools in place. Uh, it is a good public awareness for us to at least understand uh, how, how this has been a part of our history. Uh, one of the interesting scientists, Dr. Richard Mueller, uh, out of the University of California, has been doing some significant research showing that what he believes is uh, what he calls as a nemesis, that there's another failed star out there, well, well beyond the Oort cloud, that there's debris orbiting that cloud that gets pushed 
on cyclic events millions of years, not 3,600 years like Nibiru's orbit, orbit, but millions of years, this cyclic event takes place where debris gets pushed to the inner part of our solar system and uh, could be subject to whacking us. Here's uh, one of the depictions showing, showing this uh, nemesis star, which would be like on the other side of our solar system, and that we would, you know, there would be an object that could orbit between both of those suns. So for instance, if we have, if we have a planet X, let's say, in Nibiru, it's very possible uh, through the work of like the Hubble telescope imaging other solar systems, we see that a lot of them are binary, having two suns. So it's very possible that our solar system is also binary, but our, our sun, our second sun, is a failed sun, sitting way out there in space. But again, the event that takes place is that there is uh, debris that's cycling around that failed sun and comes also back into our vicinity. And Dr. Mueller said that this happened on a, a cyclic event that took place over millions of years. Um, so again, another one of the asteroids being tracked in Earth's vicinity uh, was this asteroid called uh, 4179 Toitus. And, and it's just very interesting that, uh, again, there are asteroids being plotted that, you know, for, for what they call to be like a really, 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 really close asteroid would be anything passing between the distance of the Earth and our moon. It doesn't happen very often, but if an asteroid does pass between the Earth and our moon, that is kind of like the window of like red alert. So they have been detecting some of these, and we've sent out uh, uh, probes and orbiters. We actually landed on a comet just recently, which was a very uh, interesting uh, accomplishment. But we take, you know, infrared, and, or excuse me, we take uh, instrument readings and try and analyze the orbital path of how this asteroid is spinning to see if we can plot if it's ever going to be on a, a collision course with Earth. So some of the other uh, interesting points, as I'll start to wrap it up here, are uh, the Sumerians had another very interesting aspect of the artifacts that they left, where they had depictions of what the Sumerian gods called Ijiji. Now these were also Anunnaki. Anunnaki and Ijiji are two words basically meaning the same thing. Ijiji were the Anunnaki that stayed up aboard the craft. And the Sumerians wrote specifically that these Ijiji had helpers that helped them and would sometimes come to Earth, would fly their craft, or would relay information by the Anunnaki to the people. And interestingly enough, these, these depictions of these helpers look just like our modern day gray aliens. And these are artifacts, again, that we have on display and have been you know, held uh, in the museums around the world. And the Sumerians described these as helpers of the Anunnaki. And that there were actually texts that would tell you how you could interact with this being to find out whether or not it was actually alive or not. Because they said that some of these beings acted as though they were alive, but clearly weren't. So for me, how do I interpret that as other than it was probably an android or some type of uh, hybrid being that the Anunnaki created? Another depiction of, uh, of these helpers. So it's just a very interesting uh, coincidence when we look at the bulbous you know, heads, the overshaped eyes, and the connection or the correlation to the same things that we have now with, with UFO reports and the aliens uh, being abducted or humans being abducted by these greys. And one of the things I'd like to point out is, I didn't, you know, we can't in the, in the time completely cover this information, but one of the big points of the Anunnaki and their tale bequeathed to the Sumerians is, again, they were their living gods. So God, in that official sense, was the, the, the Anunnaki explained that they basically took the pre-hominoid man, the Neanderthal man, that was evolving here naturally, and took 20% of their genes and 80% of the Anunnaki gene to create, excuse me, to create us in their image and after their likeness. Just like the Bible says, word for word. So it's a very interesting tale that the Sumerians tell us the Anunnaki created us to be workers, like a slave race, to mine the gold out of southern Africa. The Anunnaki originally coming here needed to repair Nibiru's atmosphere. Now again, this is all written down in Sumerian text, very detailed explanation. The Sumerians uh, say the Anunnaki came here originally seeking gold and other fine precious elements to repair their atmosphere. Uh, so when they, first, when they first started doing this excavation of, of the gold, roughly 300,000 years ago in southern Africa, they found out this is a very toiling job. They didn't like having to do it. So they created a worker race, us. And there are several Sumerian depictions and tablets that show, just like in the Adam and Eve tale in English, uh, there is an actual Sumerian tale of where one of, the, uh, one of the Anunnaki scientists, her name was Ninharsad, created the first perfect working model, and she called it the Adam. 
And in, in Hebrew, there's a word called Adamu, which means worker. So it's not in English like Adam as a name. It was Adamu as a worker. And there's an actual cylinder seal where she's holding up this being and she says, my hands have made it. And the tale goes on to tell where the first version, the arm didn't work, the kidney didn't function, and so finally they had the perfect working model. So the, the interesting connection I show between these helpers and today's modern day UFO depictions is I think it's very possible if the Anunnaki did create us in their image and after their likeness, that they could have another race of beings, a hybrid race that they may have created or you know, spliced their genes with that are here now kind of overseeing us or kind of watching their grand experiment. And the reason why I say that is a lot of times when people report alien abduction, they're taken on a craft, there's uh, reproductive fluids taken, um, um, it's basically like a medical examination that takes place. So it's very possible that they're taking this information, gathering it and relaying it back to the Anunnaki about how their grand experiment of us is coming along. Now I have to, I would have to kind of speculate in saying, why don't we see the aliens today? Where are all the aliens? Why are you know, the UFO is such a hush-hush topic? And my own personal opinion on it is that I feel like the public at large is being desensitized to this information. I started my research again 10, 11 years ago, and as a college student, uh, I learned how to approach this information by having to be up here and telling you about it because suffering the ridicule of coming to my peers and other, you know, uh, college students at the time and saying, you know, this is true, this is going on, all this information is true, um, the government isn't going to come straight out and tell us this. And my own personal opinion is, is that there's probably some type of galactic federation of planets or a conglomerate race of beings, like we see depicted in Star Wars or Star Trek, for, for what have you, that for whatever reason, um, we are on quarantine. They are not allowed to come here because we need to be pushed ever so slightly in our own way to make these changes for ourselves. Quit blowing up the planet, quit killing each other, quit expelling natural resources. What are we gonna do with more technology on, you know, on a whole other than to misuse it? So I, my personal opinion on is, is that the reason why we're not seeing outright alien interaction as described very clearly by the ancient texts is that we are now facing a time when we're being nudged in the direction to join that community. But we have to do it on our own, and those steps need to be taken on an evolutionary process. So I just personally think that we've never been alone, and that hopefully if we can, as, a, as an Earth civilization, get our, get our stuff together, uh, maybe these events will take place uh, again in our lifetime. So I'll go ahead and end it here, and I would say that all the information that I've showed you and any of the topics that I've discussed are freely available on my website, xfacts.com. And uh, I, I would encourage you to go and look at some of these artifacts. Again, I have over 500 digital images showing the Sumerian artifacts in detail where hopefully at some point in our future, as we start to learn more about our past, we can really start to realize where we do come from. Thank you very much.